Hi, this is Mark Patterson, University Ombuds for Cal State University Channel Islands, here with another edition of Channel Our Potential, where we ask the question, what does it mean to you to channel our potential at CSUCI? The next guest for the series will be Scott Perez, who is the Director of Research and Sponsor Programs for CSUCI and has been doing it since 2017. But he has a long history in it, in fact, beginning his days as a student employee at CSU Northridge, where he completed both his bachelor's and master's degree in music and anthropology, respectively. In addition to working at CSUN and now at Channel Islands, he's also served in this capacity or similar capacities at UCLA. So with that, we'll go to Scott Perez. Hey, Scott, glad we could get this uh, going. And this is Channel Our Potential, where we talk about how people are connecting problem solvers across campus and always ending with the question, how do we channel our potential at Channel Islands? So let me start, Scott, by kind of asking, what got you interested in the broadest sense in the work of uh, research and sponsored programs, this relatively new uh, industry within higher education? I uh, got into this line of work like most people who were in this line of work, which is by accident, <laughs> unintentionally. I uh, got my first position in sponsored programs actually at the Northridge campus in early 1992. Really didn't know anything about it. Um, so definitely uh, uh, did a lot of uh, on the job learning uh, as uh, do most folks in, in this line of work, um, but really uh, have enjoyed the work. There's uh, a lot of change. Um, constantly in, in what we do in our office. Uh, there's always something new, um, a new uh, sponsor that we're applying to or a new regulation or compliance issue that uh, we're dealing with or uh, dealing with working with a faculty member or a staff member who we haven't worked with in the past and getting to learn about what, uh, what projects they're working on uh, I think working in academia is really satisfying uh, for me because it's something that's contributing to uh, the greater good, I think. You know, generating new information, new processes um, that help society at large. You really have a role that connects students, faculty, program directors, administrators, uh, and touching on so many different levels. I'm wondering too, you mentioned a compliance aspect and that's, you know, usually you think of compliance in most industries and certainly within higher ed, there's a little bit of a fear factor. Like, oh, those are the folks who are there to kind of, you know, wrap my fingers with the ruler. So how do you balance that compliance responsibility with the collaboration that is, that is the atmosphere that you appreciate in higher education? It is uh, sometimes a little bit of a, a tug of war, uh, usually between the what we call the principal investigator or project director, the person who's going to be uh, in charge of the project if their proposal is funded, and uh, regulations uh, that are set out either by the sponsor, whether that be a federal, state, or local government, or a private foundation even, or even a, a local company. Sometimes uh, you can be in a situation where you've got a, a project with a fairly low funding limit. You know, the sponsor will only provide say $100,000. And the principal investigator who wants to accomplish, you know, a very significant project. Um, and sometimes those things don't match up completely uh, and and you have to uh, work with the project to tailor it to fit that specific funding opportunity so that can set up some uh, some difficult situations uh, because as part of our submission process we have to route the proposal to various stakeholders on campus who have to review budgetary and programmatic aspects and as you're you're working towards deadlines and uh, recognizing the external demands that almost any grant or other funding source is going to place on you. How do you get ahead of it? I, I mean, it, again, it seems like it would be easy to fall into a role of you know, you know, the, the ruler on the finger. How do you kind of build that collaboration aspect into the work? Let folks know 
what our process is um, as much as we can, because we don't want to be having to really dive into that only at the time somebody comes to our office. We'll meet with uh, different stakeholders. Maybe it's a project that's going to be having the campus move in a, in a new direction or, or, or take on some activities that it hasn't uh, pursued in the past. And we know, you know, we're going to need to talk to folks in BFA and student affairs, as well as folks in academic affairs, uh, to talk about how we're going to carry this, this project out. Or it's got some requirements that we're not used to. And so we want to we wanna explore those, uh, try to, to reach a common understanding and prepare for whatever it is that that award is going to require of us so that we can carry that project out successfully. But flexibility, foresight, and transparency are all kind of in your in your wheelhouse. But I, I apologize that the analogy sounds crude, but almost like in some ways you're like a concierge in, uh, <laughs> with you know, all these different um, entities on campus, at least for some longer term projects, uh, needing to kind of bring them together to explore how this this funding opportunity, this this the program opportunity, may change the direction or change things. I mean, that's that's a, a, I think really a powerful model. Uh, can you share any other examples of how you might have had opportunities to kind of make those unusual connections or the concierge of of problem solving? So we uh, received notice recently of uh, a pending award from NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency for a project that's housed in um, uh, the uh, Santa Rosa Island Research Station. Um, so we were uh, excited that it was going to be funded, but the agency notified us that there was an issue that we had to deal with and they provided, before they could release the award, and they provided very little information to our office about exactly what the problem was. So just basically that a student had received an overpayment. That was all, uh, all the information I had. And this, uh, this little piece of paper they sent had a phone number. <laughs> so I <laughs> dialed the number and someone, uh, it turns out it was the Department of Veterans Affairs and someone answered the phone and the first words out of their mouth were, what is the student's name? <laughs> And this person was very nice and said, well, um, okay, I understand, but unless you can provide me with the name of a student, I can't do anything for you. So I uh, worked with some folks uh, in student affairs as well as uh, financial aid, um, you know, made some connections I wouldn't normally have to make, I wouldn't uh, normally have made. And uh, with a lot of uh, phenomenal help from uh, uh, those folks in particular in uh, Veterans Affairs on, on campus was able to track down what had happened. And it turns out um, it was a mistake on the government's part. Another example is the recent CARES funding that was provided to most universities uh, across the, the US um, as a result of the, the pandemic. And these are funds that were issued uh, through the US Department of Education. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those funds had to go directly to students but it was um, a lot of a lot of work. Not so much for our office. We were we were involved in the front end in terms of getting some uh, very straightforward proposals submitted to the federal government. But I know uh, financial aid and a lot of areas uh, across campus worked very very hard uh, over a very short timeline to ensure eligibility to the students who receive funding and to provide information to the government about how they, how the campus was going to distribute those funds. You know, I love those two examples, Scott, and that in some way they're both quick reaction, but almost opposite ends of the spectrum. In the first instance, you're having to kind of be a sleuth and you're just kind of, you just got to keep digging to kind of resolve an issue in areas where you normally wouldn't work. And the other one, you're sort of helping set up the system for success, other people who may be carrying on. And in each situation, you're adapting to provide the support, whether it's digging in or 
laying out a foundation for others. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of what really strikes me about the role of, of kind of adaptive, flexible uh, work that you have to do with still keeping the compliance piece in mind. Uh, you know, right. Hopefully you're answering to, to people who are funding sources of all different types. Collaboration is something that is becoming more and more uh, commonplace in sponsored programs. They're looking at research that um, backs up the notion that a very diverse team can have better success than a team that is very uniform. So not only in terms of bringing various disciplines together and sub-disciplines, but literally the members of the project team itself. Um, so they're mm -hmm. seeing that diversity in gender, diversity in cultural background, diversity in race and ethnicity, um, that overall diversity from as many angles as possible strengthens the team and produces better results for whatever issue that team is, is working on. So not only are um, sponsors encouraging and in some cases requiring um, applicants to approach their proposal with a, you know, from, from a team um, perspective, they are actually funding research to study how diversity helps tackle uh, important issues. And sponsors are really coming to value collaboration because they see that it strengthens um, the process. Uh, the chancellor's office has uh, created some new um, affinity groups um, where faculty from different disciplines can uh, communicate with each other, meet each other, mm -hmm. find out you know, uh, about their various interests and, and scholarly activities and work together to, um, you know, uh, develop and submit proposals. You know, the, the temptation would be just to focus on disciplines, like you say, and it would be easy to even just talk about, well, we just set up the right diversity mix on a panel, like you know, some kind of publicity photo and just wash your hands. But your work is yeah. post-award. Your work is continual and the CSU as a whole is helping both set it up and lead to continued collaboration that's you know, built on stronger relations. At least I'm hearing you say that, uh, and that is exciting. I think it's you know, certainly a focus for Channel Islands in, in, in enhancing equity uh, in, for all students as well as faculty and other employees. Let me, let me conclude with the, the question that I like to finish everyone with. And I think we've actually kind of led into it a little bit with just your last answer. And what does it mean to you, Scott, to channel our potential at CSU Channel Islands? I see that as, you know, working obviously collaboratively, collaboratively uh, with my team in the office and with uh, faculty and administrators across the, the campus, not only in academic affairs, but uh, business and finance, and student affairs, and the foundation to uh, work together to, you know, uh, generate new knowledge, as I touched on earlier, um, solve problems, create opportunities for our students. Um, undergraduate research is absolutely a best practice and certainly a really core value of uh, Cal State Channel Islands. So it's, I think, is something that uh, really can make a, a big difference, you know, not only for our students, but for our faculty and uh, the campus as a whole and the region and the uh, entire state of California when you look at all 23 campuses uh, working together to accomplish goals. Thank you, yeah, that's... Uh expansive vision starting local and moving state and even nation. I think a great example of channeling our potential. 